Welcome to Group Thinkers, the podcast from RKD Group. I'm Justin McCord, and with me is Ronnie Richard. Uh, Ronnie, on today's show, we have Rhea Wong from Rhea Wong Consulting. Uh, Rhea came into our sphere by way of the, uh, the bridge conference that happened uh, recently, where she was the closing keynote and did a dynamite job. And, uh, and so since then have gotten to know her a little bit and, and that prompted us wanting to have her on the show. Tell us a little bit about Rhea. Yeah, Rhea, Rhea started her career, um, at the age of 26, she was the executive director of breakthrough New York. So she's coming in. I know me personally at age 26, I barely knew what I was doing in my career or what I wanted to be. So she's here executive director and is, you know, thrown into this world of fundraising and didn't really know kind of what she was doing and didn't felt like she didn't really have any resources and just kind of learned along the way. Um, and ultimately she talks about how she kind of experienced some burnout and something that uh, is happening across the nonprofit industry. Uh, but she kind of stepped back after that and started her own consulting uh, business. And now she works with nonprofits to kind of pass that knowledge forward. And a couple of things that really stood out to me in the conversation was when she started talking about this focus on donor prospects and how everybody's after getting, you know, finding new donors and, and getting new donors, but they're, but there's not enough focus on retention and this leaky bucket syndrome that happens uh, at organizations where you bring donors in and they just go right out the door. It's like plug your bucket first, focus on that retention and keeping those donors. And then maybe you won't need to find as many new donors either. And then she also talked a lot about uh, along the same vein, like understanding what people's values are and why they gave to your organization and what that means to them and who they are. So I, I think those things are really important right now as we're kind of going through this, I guess, transformation of the industry. Like, would you, what's, is that what you would call it maybe, I guess, a new chapter? Yeah, yeah, definitely a new chapter. And I love that you hit on those points. You're going to hear Rhea talk, uh, well, and you're going to hear her talk about the Grateful Dead. And so that's kind of fun for me. You're also going to hear her talk about, I think, the aspects of uh, tribal marketing and the importance of understanding why someone is interested in you. Like, where do you align in values or perspective with your donors? And your volunteers and frankly i think that's a uh, an area that if we can better unlock it we're going to see a surge in uh in value uh in terms of the relationships that we have with our donors so um some really interesting stuff uh she is um such a a, a ball of energy and so it's a fun conversation and so yeah, with, uh, with no further delay, here is Rhea Wong on Group Thinkers. Rhea, you look excited. I, I'm like, it's go time. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so the last time you and I saw each other, it was a couple weeks ago, we were standing on stage in front of a, a couple thousand people and, uh, you know, no big deal. You were rocking it, delivered a closing keynote for the bridge conference that um, was a resounding success by all indications. Like, can we just rewind to that moment for a second? What did that feel like for you to deliver a message of substance to that type of audience? Well, I will tell you, Justin, and I put this on my LinkedIn, like, Real talk, th this is the biggest audience that I've been in front of, right? So when I do keynotes, it's usually like a couple hundred people. Um, so I I was a little scared, not going to lie, not going to lie. But actually, once I got going, I feel like I, I got into my rhythm. Uh, hopefully, the message resonated with folks. Um, you know, I try not to take it personally when I saw people like leaving out the back. I was like, I'm just going to assume that you have a train to catch and this is not about me, uh, which is yeah. sort of like fundraising too. Like, I'm just going to assume like 
it's not because you hate me, just because you got other things going on. But um, yeah, it felt good. And uh, I mean, you tell me. You were in the audience, so I have no idea how it was received. But it, it felt it felt like it landed. But you know. Oh, it totally landed. Okay. Are you cool. kidding me? I mean, like, look, and and here's the thing. Yes, there's going to be people that have meetings or whatever, and they're trying to get to places. Uh, the the crowd was so into it. And, oh, cool. uh, and, and Ronnie Rhea did a great job of, you know, with, a you know, let's call it 2000 people there, uh, creating points of interaction. So stand up, sit down, talk to your neighbor, work out these three things, use some, um, some techniques to make it thoughtful and meaningful. And, uh, and, and that was unique because it wasn't just a point of consumption. So a lot of times, yeah. and you know, keynotes are all shapes and sizes. Keynotes can be consumption minded where you're, you're just drawing off of, of what's being said. But, uh, I saw many people like testifying to what you were saying, Rhea. And so that was awesome. And I think that, it went, thank you, Justin. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think people took stuff home too. Cause I, I recall seeing on LinkedIn, you know, maybe like a week later, people referencing that closing keynote, somebody saying that their line are you playing to win or just not to lose really stuck with them so i i think i think it definitely hit awesome thanks ronnie i appreciate that yeah i mean i um i get really fired up not necessarily because i love the spotlight but because i'm just so passionate about our sector and providing value and you know i'm constantly sharing things that have helped me ideas books i've read things i've come across because I, I, like it's a hard job and there's so much that we're asked to do and so i feel like my role is like if i can make your job just a little bit easier <laughs> and i can help you raise a little bit more money then i that's you know my thing is really how can i deliver the most value so honestly it would be more troubling to me to hear someone say like, that wasn't actually that helpful or that valuable versus like, oh, she stunk. Like, okay, yeah. both things would suck, of course. But like, to me, because my whole mission is like, how can I deliver the most value to you? That would be the worst thing to hear. Um, that's that's really well said. It really is. The You referenced something um, just in terms of your mindset and your approach and especially with the pressures that uh that nonprofit leaders face and uh and that holds a special place in your heart because that's a part of your story so walk us back to mm -hmm. you know 2005 uh around that time whenever you stepped into breakthrough new york and uh and and what you experienced in terms of your your time as a fundraiser and nonprofit leader. Yeah, thanks for asking. So I tell the story a lot. I was uh, 26 years old, so you can do the math. That's how old I am now. Um, and I didn't know anything, right? I was given the keys and an email address. And, and look, I don't want to say I did it alone. I mean, I had a team. I had two and a half staff members, including myself. So a tiny little team. Um, I had a board. So I, I also just want to call out like I wasn't this lone ranger. But that being said, I mean, I hadn't had any experience with fundraising other than like selling candy bars, you know, for elementary school. And then I think I did like a fundraiser for, you know, an AIDS marathon. Right. That was a sum total of my fundraising. And so I think it's insane that we ask people to try to solve some of the most intractable problems in our society, education, uh, reproductive rights, cleaning the environment, saving the whales, and give them zero. Like many people have zero experience. Like I was just thinking about it today. I was getting my hair cut. You know, in New York, you have to have something like 800 hours of training to be a barber. You know how many hours of training you need to have to be a fundraiser? Zero. You have to have a just pulse. A pulse. Just a yeah, pulse. Yeah, just a pulse. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, I remember being in that role and feeling totally hopeless, being very panicked, trying to try all the things, right? Because I'm just like, I just need to find something that works. And knowing how it feels to, to feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm failing at my job, at a job that I care so deeply about, about a mission I care so deeply about. And 
you know, the rest, like sleepless nights, I'm sure you've been there, Dustin, you know, waking up in a cold sweat at three o'clock, like, did I send that email? Um, <laughs> I'm getting like PTSD talking about it. Uh, but I just don't want that to happen for other people. So if I can save them at least one sleepless night, I feel like I will have done my job. But you know, it wasn't really until I started to learn how to do it that I realized not only was there a framework for it, but that we could teach people the skills so they didn't all have to learn trial by fire, right? I mean, so many of us have been thrown into the deep end and told to swim. Why don't we throw people floaties? Like, why don't we give them swimming lessons? We don't have to do this. And I think that's part of the reason why people burn out so much because they're in this situation that feels like they can't win and told that if they can't win, it's their fault. Like they did something wrong. They're not grinding hard enough. They're not working hard enough. Uh, and I just think that that is not fair. It's so interesting. We've, in some ways, I think we've lost the value of mistakes. And we've also, mm -hmm. we've created these scenarios where, yeah, you know, you think about a, a, a leader at a nonprofit of any size and they are boxed in on the decisions that they have to make, right? So, you know, okay. you've got the board and or executive team putting pressure from the top. You've got mm -hmm. their direct reports putting pressure from the bottom. You've got program delivery putting pressure from one side. You've got donors putting pressure from another side. And so, you know, it, it doesn't, it should not surprise us the, the amount of burnout and or short-term decision-making because it's mm. just, what do I have to do in this moment yep. to solve for this fundraising goal? So let me just yep. deal with that and not think yep. about the, the long-term impact. And, yep. uh, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not something that we, we, people can't continue to operate that way. That's why you're yep. seeing the, the burnout rates that you're seeing. So, yep. so did you burn out? I think so. I mean, to be frank, I think I probably should have left my organization two years before I actually did. And I stuck around for those extra two years because I had to put everything in place to make sure that it was in a good place when I left. But you know, my my zest for it, I think, really burned out uh, earlier than I left. And, you know, I think about what I know now about brain science, which I didn't know then, which is, you know, our brains are only ever operating in one of two modes, survival or executive. And we spend 70% of our time in survival mode. And for nonprofit EDs, I would say probably it's more like 90%, right? And so what happens in survival mode is our brain is constantly on fire because we are perceiving everything as an attack, as if it was a saber-toothed tiger coming at us. So what, what do we do when we're in a threatened position? We either fight, we flee, or we freeze. And I know a lot of fighters, right? Because like, we come to the cause because we're so passionate and we believe in the thing. And so what that looks like with fighting is putting in the hours, grinding harder, but it doesn't actually help you to think expansively. So I think to your point, it, there's like short term decision making, because frankly, when you're out rounding a saber tooth tiger, you're not thinking you know, about your next week or next year, right? You're like, how do I get out of the situation right now? Like, I'm going right. to climb this tree right now. And I can't think about what climbing this tree is going to be for me like a week from now, <laughs> but like what's happening right now. Sorry, this is a, a metaphor that's sort of falling apart. But the point is like when we're constantly in that survival mode, we're constantly in that like we need to solve the problem right now. It really keeps us from long-term planning. It keeps us from creativity. It keeps us from coming from a place of, uh, responsiveness rather than reaction, right? We're always in the red zone. And to your point, it's not sustainable. You cannot be in the red zone for a long period of time without physically, mentally, and emotionally breaking down. So when you're in this survival mode and you said, you know, the last two years or so, you probably felt like you were either approaching burnout or at that stage from there kind of what was your next step because then you started your consulting firm right and how did you have to take a step back and and think about okay now that i'm out of this like go 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 and do everything now phase like what do i want to do like or did you kind of have that moment earlier um earlier in the yeah. in time 
Yeah, that's a good question, Ronnie. So, I mean, truthfully, I actually joined a tech firm for about two and a half months after I left being an ED because I just thought it would be an interesting pivot. It was sort of, there was a connection between the nonprofit world and and tech. So it wasn't like completely different. Um, Quickly learned it was not for me, (laughs) was not a fit. Uh, so I jumped out and for the first time in my life, I was like, I don't know what's next. Like, what, what, what is this thing, right? Because I'd always been defined by my job or, you know, when you're in school, it's like, okay, we know what we're doing. We're going in like high school and college and da da I'd never not had a job. And for, you know, a Chinese American oldest daughter, like that is like, I don't even know who I am if I don't have a job to do. Um, and so for the longest, I would have to fight myself from when I answer my phone saying, Rhea, Breakthrough New York. I was like, no, no, no I'm, I'm just Rhea. Um, so truthfully, I had not intended to be a consultant. Um, I picked up a couple of projects as I thought an in-between thing between finding jobs. You know, I had a lot of friends who are EDs are like, oh, you have some free time? Great. Here, help me with this. So one project led to the next to the next. And I was like, oh, I guess this is what I'm doing now. And the other thing is like I was seeing all these JDs and I was like, I have zero percent want to do any of these, you know. And truthfully, I think because I was burnt out, I think I was also getting some I, I I mean I joke and I say PTSD, but I actually do think there was some real PTSD with the experience. Um and then I kind of came to it, and this is kind of mid pandemic. I was like, what's the thing that everybody needs? I, it was like two things. I surveyed my audience. Thing one was always about HR, you know, staff, talent, staff. And I was like, I don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. The other thing is fundraising. I was like, well, you know what? Pretty good. I figured out how to do this. I'm really curious about ways to do it better. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, if you have no money in the system, like you have no lifeblood, I don't care how passionate you you are. Even Gandhi had to fundraise, right? And so Mm -hmm. the other thing is like, I care about a lot of things. Like I care about many different issues, but I'm one person. I can't do all the things, but what I can do is help the people who are doing the things to get more resources to do the things. Mm. So this was kind of my answer to like, oh, this is how this is how I multiply myself. Like in the multiverse, I can support all these things by you know what what's that phrase like teach a man to fish? Like I'm teaching them all yeah. to fish so that they have enough fish. You found your passion in a different place. And and I don't know that it's yeah, you know the way that that we go through life things ebb and flow and purpose can sometimes ebb and flow and so maybe there are points of pressure and even that burnout moment to where it's not that you were without passion it's just that it was it was masked by all of the pressures that you had been feeling and uh and so Mm -hmm. you went from you know a passion for helping students into a passion for actually creating students in some way in terms of the, yeah. the nonprofit sector. And so, so then, so how does the book come into this? Like what point in the journey did, uh, get that money, honey, when did that spark into your soul? Like, how did you go about getting, getting that on paper, all of those pieces? Yeah. So I have to give a shout out to my co-writer, Isabella Masucci, who actually was my student back in the day. So I've known her since she was 12 years old. And um, I was doing my courses, you know, I was doing group coaching and I was like, you know what, this is great, but I am constrained by the amount of people who can A, enter my courses and be frankly afford them. I mean, they're not inexpensive. And yet I feel like the knowledge I have can be really helpful. So I worked with Bella and that was kind of my pandemic project. I was like, how about I just write down all of the stuff that people ask me about all the time that I teach and I just put it out there and I sell it for $15 or actually even less if you're listening to it on Audible, right? Because to me, again, it's how do I create the most value for people? Mm -hmm. And you know, these basic frameworks are things that I learned after I was in the nonprofit sector. And I was like, you know, all of this stuff would have been really helpful for me if I had learned this when I was an ED. And unfortunately with, you know, my board, bless their hearts, like they, they uh, were supportive, but there was never any explicit discussion about like, how are we going to get you these skills to improve our mm-hmm. outcomes? Because the thing is like, we had great outcomes because the truth is like, I just grind, grinded harder. What's the past mm-hmm. time? Ground. Anyway. Gr- ground? Um, 
Yeah. I, I was just like, like hustling. Right. And yeah. the thing is, as board members, they don't know how to fundraise either. So it was just sort of like, okay, like the blind leading the blind. And I was like, okay, there has to be a better way here. So, um, you know, I've always thought that there was a book in me. I thought it would I thought it was the great American novel. Turns out it was a fundraising book. <laughs> uh, but, you know, more to come. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question. Other than, yeah, get the book, read it, do the stuff. I mean, it's really just reps, right? Because I think the other thing is people think that fundraising is so difficult and so mysterious. And the truth is that, A, it's not rocket science. Like, you can probably figure it out. And B, it's just a math problem. Them, right so the more people you talk to the more asks that you put out there the more no's you get but the more yeses you get and so i think you know i, I don't know if either of you work out or anyone listening works out but it's like going to the gym you just got to do the reps like you can't expect to go to the gym and lift 100 pounds the first time you go right you got to work up to it but it's really it's it's compounding the reps that will get you the results i'm curious um obviously having been in the sector now that you're still in the sector but not directly at a nonprofit have are there some things that you've seen um in the realm of fundraising that's really stood out to you as um uh, things that either need to change or things that you just didn't realize when you were at a nonprofit uh, kind of an open-ended question but uh i'm just curious like how are you how are you seeing things from you know from the outside looking in more now Oh, Ronnie, 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 where can I even begin? <laughs> so many things. Okay, I'll tell you, one of the things I got, have a bug up my butt about right now is the concept of donors, right? Or donor prospects. So the number one problem, everyone's like, I need more donors, I need more donors, I need more donors. Well, number one, that may be true, but let, I often think the first place to look is your past donor. So we all know it's cheaper to raise a dollar from someone who's already given than a new donor. And I think part of why we feel like we need to keep refilling the bucket is that the bucket is leaky. Like you are losing so many donors out of the holes because like our donor retention rates are really terrible. It's like what, 45%? Yeah. Yeah. So like you're literally, like you're not even like breaking even that there. That might be a like good one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're actively losing. So my first thing is like, okay, plug your leaky bucket. What do I mean by that? Look at your donor retention rates. Look at the touch points. And I think sometimes we have this idea like, well, I just, I sent the thank you notes and I, you know, put them on my newsletter. I'm like, well, obviously that's not enough. Number one, you need to tell them, what did you do with their money? Because at the end of the day, when I, it's an exchange, right? It's a value exchange. So like if I go to Whole Foods and I give them 20 bucks and I get a peanut, like that was an exchange. We can argue whether it's a fair exchange or not. In the nonprofit sector, <laughs> really nice if peanut, I give a donation, by the way, it's really very good peanut. It's a very nice yeah, one. Yeah, it's, it's like a perfect peanut, it's you know, picked at the peanut. height of dawn by fairies. Just, yeah, I get it. yeah, just, just one. Just um, one. But, uh, but when we're giving a donation, there is an exchange. It's just a bit of a delayed gratification, right? It's like, okay, I'm giving you money because I want to see a thing happen. I want some impact. I want, you know, the wells built, the kids educate, like whatever. If you don't tell people what you did with their money, you're not closing that story. And so people will feel like they got ripped off because it's like, I gave you $20 and I didn't get my peanut. So I think that's the first thing was we need to tell people what we did with their money. Um, I also think we need to treat people like they're people, right? So often I think, especially when you get into this like survival mindset, you get real transactional and you stop seeing people as people and you, and you start seeing them as just walking checkers. Like I got to like get them to give me money. I got to like figure out how to like extract. And I think it's so much a mindset of this, you know, extractive capitalist system that we're living in is that we see people as resources to be extracted, not as mm -hmm. human beings that want to be part of something. So I think that's thing one. I also think the other thing is, Ronnie, you just opened the whole can of worms. I, I told you it was open-ended. <laughs> um, I think the 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 question of value is really important here so as nonprofit leaders we think about value for our beneficiaries right like our clients we think about you know how are we helping them we don't think enough i think about the value that we're giving our donors because the, they're 
giving you a donation because they want something. And I don't mean like in that gross way of like, I want to be recognized and I want you to kiss my butt and I want you to like a my name on a building. I don't mean like that. I mean, they're giving because it's something about who they tell themselves that they are. They want to make an impact. They want to give back. They want to feel part of community. They want to teach their kids something, right? Like, so figure out what that thing is and then just give them more of it. And I think so often we, I think now with this like trend in community centric fundraising, which I don't think is a negative trend, but I also think we tend to think of providing value to our donors as like something dirty, like, oh, like mm. it's in, like we're getting in a white savior complex. I'm like, no, no, no. Everybody wants to feel special, right? I talk about Danny mm -hmm. Meyer here in New York. He, Danny Meyer, you know, he has 11 Madison Park and Gramercy Tavern. And he's like a famous restaurateur. And he said, imagine everyone is walking around with an invisible sign around their neck that says, make me feel special. Mm. And I think everyone deserves to feel special. So anyway, so that's like my bugaboo about donor retention. <laughs> that's <laughs> fascinating. So, so just a couple of comments yeah, there yeah, yeah. Or, or thoughts as you walk through it. Uh, yes is the first comment because right. you know we we even uh in the last month or so we put out some research where we dug deep into trust and found that say found it's 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 not surprising but it's revelatory that the the trust factors trust is actually built off of transparency and competency Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. being transparent and being competent means tell me what you're going to do, do it, and then tell me that you did it, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's all it comes down to. And and then likewise, it's about an emphasis on trust more than an emphasis on relationship. And mm -hmm. we work so hard at the idea of being donor centered and donor centric and relationship fundraising. And those are terms that have been uh, normalized for now 20 years. And in that same two decade time frame, we've lost 20 million, million households that are giving. And maybe we should stop trying to be everyone's best friend and start being worthy of their trust in that follow through. I'll, I'll give you an example, Rhea. Uh, a, a year ago, my son, he's 14. He was raising money for his soccer club to help offset cost for his club to go to Europe. Mm. And so, you know, it was, it was a significant fundraising ask and lesson. And this just gets dad fired up. Like, all right, I'm going to teach him what this looks like. And so making the initial ask easy. He was super comfortable, like recording quick little videos on his phone, sending them to grandparents, and aunts and uncles and friends and those sorts of things. And, uh, and so, you know, he received all the pledges to hit his goal, which was fantastic. Then I said, okay, now after every game, you got to follow through and tell them exactly what happened. Like what happened in this game? Why, what did you learn in this game? And why mm -hmm. does their investment in you matter? right? Mm -hmm. Because that's closing that loop. And I wonder if even the use of the word donation, that it, it's something that feels too much like charity mm -hmm. and not enough like investment. And mm -hmm. if we thought about it like an investment, it would in turn uh, require a return, right? In yep. order for it to be a good investment. And so, yeah, I think that we, in so many ways, again, back to the idea of the pressure cooker that our nonprofit friends live in, that pressure cooker sometimes builds these behaviors that we get trapped in and don't know how yeah. to get out of. And that's yeah. a part of the the gap in, uh, in what's created these low retention rates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that might be helpful to your listeners that was certainly helpful to me is to recast yourself as not an extractor of resources, but rather a philanthropic advisor. Because when you're a philanthropic advisor, you are working on behalf of your client to help them make the best investment for them, right? And I think when we get ourselves out of this idea, like, I just need to like get all the money and we're like, huh, 
can I find people who are aligned with the thing that I want to do that I'm doing in the world who also want to do this thing and like build a you know, essentially matchmake, right? Like, Justin, you tell me that you care desperately about the whales. Guess what? We're saving the whales. How are we going to do this? Like, let's do it together. And that feels so much less uh, icky and extractive because I think the reason people think that fundraising is icky is it, it's been done in an icky way. It's been done in like a super transactional, extractive way where we, you know, look at people like they are ATMs. And look, it takes time. That's the other thing. We have to have the patience to build the tr trust is not built overnight. But if we have no trust, we have no transaction. And so if we're not willing to take the time to build the relationship of trust that you, you know, Justin, know me, Rhea, and know that I'm going to do good things. And I'm, you know, essentially like you're trusting me as a person because like you don't have the capacity to like go in and like check the books and all the programs. Right. Um, and I think we need to understand that like trust is a long game. And I also think as fundraisers, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of our donors. Like, is this, does this generate trust if I ask you to go to coffee and the whole time I'm just like thinking about the checklist of things that I want to say to you to like pitch you and like get you to do something for me? Like that feels awful. Like we all have been on that side of the equation where like the, you know, for me, it's going to a cocktail party and talking to someone and having them like look over my shoulder to see if there's like someone more important that they can talk to. Like it feels terrible. Right. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And I think we, yeah. And so, like, how do we spend the time to build the relationship of trust? Anyway, I'm saying the same thing over, but like, I think you and I are very aligned on that point. Yeah, no, I, I think we're totally aligned. And there is a, uh, you know, we think that there is somewhat of a sobering that is starting to bubble up in the the sector around these ideas, and uh, and it is mm -hmm. going to take a minute to to stem the tide, but. You know, Rhea, I think the, the reality is, is that if if you look at uh, chapters of philanthropy, um, you could say that we're now at a post-pandemic chapter. And so we might be emerging in, and starting a new chapter. And so we're optimistic that that new chapter includes more of an emphasis on trust and more of an emphasis on being authentic, not in the buzzy way that that word loses its meaning, but actually being a real person that's not going to think of someone at a cocktail party as an ID from their database, instead thinks of them as a real person and is engaged with them instead of worrying about, uh, who's that over there? Can I see their name tag from where I'm standing, right? Like we're at the formative yeah. stages to where these things are possible and uh and and we think that's super exciting um scary right uh and, and unpaved in a lot of ways but um it's an exciting time i think to be in the sector yeah i, I think it is and i think there's a lot that the sector can learn from the for-profit world and i think there's a lot that the for-profit world can learn from the non profit not profit sector, but you know, I want to talk about donor prospects for a second. So I, I just ran a poll on LinkedIn and the perennial question is like, why don't you have enough prospects, right? The number one reason that everyone thinks that they don't have enough prospects right now is that they've tapped out their personal networks, which may or may not be true. I don't know, right? So A, I would say it's time to interrogate that because I mean, have you literally called every single person that you know and every single person who's on your database and every single person your board members are willing to give you access to? Probably not. But aside from that, then I think the next question is like, how do we uh, how do we have a one to many approach? And that's where I think content marketing is really interesting. So I feel like a lot more nonprofits need to be thinking about how do I build a marketing channel? Like maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's God forbid, TikTok, like maybe it's a podcast. Like how do I build a platform that lets people know that I'm out here doing the thing? Because so often, because we short shift marketing, we just rely on this word of mouth and this very organic process, which like can work up to a certain point, but at some point the well runs dry, right? And so you have to let other people know about the work that you do. And then, you know, there's a paid ad strategy too, which is like is a whole other thing. But I, I feel like before you can jump to a paid ad strategy, like master one thing and, and make sure yeah. that you've fully saturated that. Um, and, you know, I love Alex Hermosi. So this is going to be my Alex Hermosi thing. But he's like, make 100 calls a day. 
like in, unless and until you're actually like making 100 calls a day, like you haven't tapped out in your network. Like I think people have this idea like I've hit my ceiling. You're like, really? Have you? Because, you know, the math would suggest that not because sending like a couple emails a day or making a couple phone calls a day, like you probably have not reached every single person in your network. Yeah, we've we've heard that even, you know, so our, our focus is on the on the mass market direct marketing side and and we hear that from okay. organizations often of, you know, like I've I've tapped out on my audience. Like I can't, you know, mm-hmm. and and you know, so then there becomes maybe an over reliance on co ops, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is you you're not. Uh, you might be uh, you might be sending to too many people. You might be you might not be focused in on the right people, right? Uh, you might be looking at the wrong data attributes and making decisions and and therefore you think that you you've tapped out or like you said which i love because it's how i cut my teeth in in sales at a minor league baseball club decades ago was make 100 phone calls a day right like get on the phone mm-hmm. and and actually talk with people like work through that grind uh and and see what you can learn from it right because that can help inform um, some of your next decisions. What I really love, Rhea, is the um, is your uh, your desire, uh, and it's become just. I mean, it's your mission at this point to provide resources, right? To, as you yeah. said, uh, be a uh, be a resource that can teach nonprofit executives to fish, and uh, and so you've got a handful of different resources. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where people can go, how they can learn more about um, learning uh, and picking up tools that you offer. Um, I would love to, but can I respond to your one question before? Because I, I feel like it's really yes, important. Of course. Um, let's talk about marketing for one second, because nonprofit marketing, by and large, mm-hmm. not not your clients, of course, Ronnie and Justin, but by and large, the marketing is so boring it's boring and i think we think that people's attention spans have gone by the wayside that may be true but i also think that the bar has raised like our standards for what we pay attention to has gotten higher right because look no one is sitting there being like people aren't watching long form netflix shows obviously they are so right. you just have to be better like you cannot recycle the same old crap. Like I feel like in the nonprofit sector, we're so afraid to offend that we don't actually turn anybody on. And like, I've never walked into a room and thought, you know, this beige is really great. Like this beige color is really, it's really working for me. Right. But I think as a sector, we are all really comfortable in beige. And, you know, and I think it's not our fault, right. It comes from a lot of different pressures from like the board. I don't want to, open myself to liability and my funders into this and then that. But here's the thing. We're on a mission to solve the biggest problems in the world. We have to be bold. We have to be willing to turn people off, right? If we if we don't turn anybody off, we're not turning anybody on. Nobody gets yeah. that excited about vanilla, right? Like vanilla ice cream, not that exciting. Uh, this is Mitch said this. Pink sherbet. People have very strong views about pink sherbet, either pro or con. Dare to be pink sherbet. Vanilla is boring. No one's paying attention to vanilla. So anyway, I'll just say that I think we also have to think about when you're sending out like the millionth appeal or the millionth email and you're not getting a response, is it because your message is boring? No, it's it's a worthwhile question. And again, it's like another point to me of how we might be at the beginning of a new chapter, right? To to be bold. Yeah. And take chances, and uh, and and that this now that we're emerging from the fog of the last couple of years, that now's the time, even while the pressure is uh, increasing, right? You've got costs that are still high. Now costs have stabilized on a lot of uh, marketing efforts, but they're still higher than what they were pre-pandemic. You've got response mm-hmm. that is that is dropping. It's creating even more of a retention vacuum. And so what do you have to lose by taking a chance on doing something different and doing something bold? Well, I'm I'm just gonna call you out right now. So 
for folks listening to the pod, Justin has a wall behind him of Grateful Dead posters. So let's talk about the Grateful Dead and how this applies to marketing, right? Number one, they did the reps. Like how many seasons on the road have they done, right? Oh my God, 50 Number years two, on the road. 50 years on the road. So they did the reps. Like the first time they went out, they probably sucked, right? After 50 years of touring, they're probably pretty freaking good at what they do. Number two, they've cultivated a community. They call themselves the deadheads. These are people who will see their show hundreds of times, follow them all throughout the country and the world, know every song, like know everything, right? So it's about cultivating a passionate community. Like you're not for everybody, but for the people that you're for, they love you. Like you are a deadhead till you die. Am I right? Yeah, right on. And then the third thing I just want to point out, like, look at these beautiful posters. You can't look at a Grateful Dead poster and be like, oh, I don't know. I don't, that doesn't really speak to me, right? Like, I don't know who that is. Like, they have a very clear aesthetic, a very clear point of view, a very clear brand. So I think these three things, I mean, I could probably pull out more. I don't know that much about the Grateful Dead, but like, it's instructive for fundraising. It is. I'm going to add a fourth. And yeah. And I'm going to go as far as to say they, for me, are an originator of modern content marketing. Now, let me break that apart for a second. Uh, in their formative days when they started touring and having concerts, et cetera, uh, once they got a record deal, the record labels uh, wanted to make sure that they were doing in-studio work albums, right? and that that was driving the brand forward. Uh, but the dead had figured something out. What their fans loved was to actually record live concerts and then trade those recordings for free. Mm -hmm. And so they fought and fought against the studio to allow their fans to record for free. And, and so much so that it became a part of the subculture of those that follow the dead to trade tapes and you know if you listen to the Sirius uh dead station they will play concerts from 1972 or 1983 or 1994 or whatever it is and uh and so it creates this avenue for giving away your resources giving away what you're good at giving away what you know which i think helps elevate belief and buy-in and authenticity between the content creator and the end recipient. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay, wait, two more things about the dead that I think is really interesting too. Number one is that they have always been completely themselves. Like it's not yeah. like they walked into the studio and they're like, we're gonna turn you into like this kind of band. Like we're gonna turn you into the next Beatles. Like that that was never the thing that they did, um, yeah. which I think is uh, speaks to you know, the power of like knowing who you are. Um, there was a second thing I have, but I completely forgot. So, but anyway, I think that the dead is instructive, like, you know, and so for anyone listening, I think take anything that you love and deconstruct it. Like what, how did you come to love this thing? How do people cultivate the community around this thing? Like the BTS army, like let's talk about the BTS army for a second. Like they are rabid fans. They will show up. No, I mean, they'll do all the things, right? I literally apparently watch BTS while they're sleeping. That's a whole weird, creepy thing. Anyway, the point is, though, that um, it's about your thousand true fans and how do you, you know, you're not for everyone, like the Grateful Dead, not for everyone, but for the people that are for, they are for them. Yeah, there's something, there's something uniquely powerful about tribes. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's, there's lots of learnings, lots of resources available. And, you know, I think, uh, maybe more important than ever for our friends that lead nonprofits to understand and, uh, and lean into whatever their tribe is in terms of the people who their constituents, cause it's not just about those that invest their dollars. It's also those that invest their time, you know, that that come alongside missions and, and give up their time. That's investing in another way. It's a tribe that you can activate into, uh, you know, being an ambassador for you outside of it. So, yeah. 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 I think it's about like give, 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 then ask, right? So 
-hmm. you know, then that's kind of how I approach it. Like I give so much for free. I have my podcast, I give resources to your point. Um, And for every give, there's not a requisite ask. And I think when people get that equation wrong, when it's like, ask, 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 then give, like that's when people get tired. Like that's when you don't inspire trust. That's when it starts to feel extractive, right? So how can we as nonprofits like give to our donors? And again, I don't mean like swag, like no one wants more crap in their house, right? I mean, like, what is the, what is the emotional experience that you are giving to people that rewards them for being a fan, right? I think about like Disneyland. So I have a, uh, a friend of mine who brought her grandson to Disneyland and they stayed at the Disney hotel and every day they left, they came back and like Mickey was positioned in a different position. Like he was, you know, reading the newspaper. He was like sitting in the back and the little three year old was like, Oh, Mickey moved while we were at Disneyland. And it's these like little moments of magic that I think we forget. Like we forget to make it special. We forget that we're yeah. all looking for some kind of emotional experience so i mean you know the best uh the best thank you i I ever got from donating to an organization is i got a handwritten note not from the ed but from a kid right and it it wasn't long it was like hi this is my name blah 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 blah. you know thank you for this like it did xyz and i remember that and i like put it on my fridge because it was meaningful because i think again when we forget the humans (laughs) we forget the humans yeah, yeah, and and it's so much right now, uh, and going forward, it's about creating experiences. To your point, right? Mm-hmm. Creating moments and letting those moments be what we can deliver back. Uh, you know, delivering back when we think about impact. Too many times we're thinking about that annual report PDF that ain't nobody interested in. It's not that mm-hmm. helpful. But if you can deliver experiences back, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, this past weekend, we, uh, my family and I, we all went and um, spent some time with a relief and development organization who has a facility here in the Dallas area. And we packed food and packed boxes. And we were doing logistical work as a part of a crew of, I don't know, 50 different volunteers. And at the end of our time, they said, in the two hours that you've been here, you've packed this many boxes. That equates to this many kids in this country who are going to be fed. Mm-hmm. And like you immediately felt the impact just by hearing them line those things out. And then, of course, they brilliantly threw a QR code up and said, look, we can, you know, what you've done today is incredible. Perhaps you want to go a step further. And so they made the, the donation ask. And I thought it was such a great way to, to activate and share the ultimate impact in real time with someone. Yeah. Well, and, and I think how much more powerful too it would have been if they'd had a conversation with you afterwards about like, what did that mean for your family? Right? Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, I think I'd like to believe as parents, we all want our children to be good people. Um, We want to teach them values and why it's important to care about your community. So like by reinforcing that message, like why did you go with your kids? Obviously you wanted to teach them something, right? So if I Mm -hmm. entered a conversation with you to help you reiterate in your own brain, like, oh yeah, this was about values. This is about teaching my kids something, something I hope that they become in the future, like caring, community-oriented people. That's a partnership for a long term because it then demonstrates that I'm not just thinking about this right now and these bags packed, but I am thinking about you and what you want for your kids in the future. Totally agree. Totally agree. Rhea, you are a bright light, my friend. Oh, thank you, friend. uh, And Ronnie, I'm sorry. I feel like we haven't brought you into the conversation at all. I'm, I'm just sitting here taking it all in. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> That's what yeah. we get when you get two chatterboxes on the line. <laughs> Ronnie's familiar. He's he puts yeah, up with it me. happens. Uh, listen, uh, for our listening audience, um, we've got an ask for you, uh, something for you mm. to consider. Uh, you know, I w- want you to go check out riawong.com. That's R. H E A W O N G dot com. Uh, on the site, you can get access to her newsletter. And so uh, she has promised pictures of her cute pup alongside with resources from what's the pup's name, by the way? 
Her name is Stella. That's my daughter's name. So let's not confuse the two. Oh. Or maybe we do a joint newsletter and we include my daughter and your pup. Uh, I mean, two so, Stellas are better than one, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, uh, so Ria and Stella available in the newsletter. If you could check out riawong.com, you can also there learn more about the accelerator course. You can learn more about her book, get that money, honey, as well as the podcast and all things Ria. Ria, thank you for hanging out with us today. Justin, Ronnie, thank you so much for having me. This is a really fun conversation. I'm sure we could go for like three more hours, but, uh, you know, we got to limit the podcast. I get it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you got to you got to limit it at some point. We got to leave people uh, hankering for more. So we'll do it again. That's right. And, That's, yeah, yeah we, let's awesome. do it again, because I, I feel like I have. I mean, you and I could riff on any number of topics that get we me got fired lots up. of bees. We got lots of bees in our bonnet that we're going to have to tackle over time. Ria. That's right. That's right. Very cool. All right, friend. We'll catch up with you soon. All right. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you, Justin. Good to see you. Yeah.